In this discussion, we're going to be going over the Laplace transform, which is a generalization of the Fourier transform. As a quick um, review of the previous of the Laplace transform lecture, um, recall that we use the Laplace transform in cases where the Fourier transform does not converge. So it's a generalization of the Fourier transform. And this difference is noted by introducing a new variable, s. So in the Laplace transform, if we take the Laplace transform of a signal f of t, we're going to do a unilateral Fourier um, Laplace transform. So we're going to take the integral from 0 to infinity of f of t and multiply it by a new exponential, s of t instead of j omega t. So, whereas in the Fourier case, um, the exponent term was purely imaginary, now we have a complex, we can represent complex um, ex terms in the exponent within the transform. So let's do the quick example, a quick example that they showed in lecture. f of t is going to be equal to e a of t, where a is greater than 0 and t is greater than 0. Now if a is greater than 0, uh, it's going to be growing. So f of t, if we take the Fourier transform, it will not converge. So we need to take the Laplace transform for this. So the Laplace transform of f of t is going to be from 0 to infinity of e of a. We can do this. It will end up being s minus a if we plug it into the formula of d of t. And this is equal to e the to the s minus a divided by s minus a of t as t as we evaluate t from infinity to zero and so this is going to be equal to infinity if s let's see It's going to be infinity if s is less than a, less than or equal to a. It's going to be 1 divided by s minus a if s is greater than a. So that's how... So since a lot of the Laplace transforms will be in this manner, where we have, we where it's... Um, equal to finite value until it's not. If you uh, look at a Laplace transform table, it's going to be give you 1 divided by s minus a for real value of s, which is sigma, greater than a. So why the real value? So we can break this down a little bit more, actually. So... Um, See, we can express the exponent e s minus a of t. So uh, that's going to be equal to sigma minus a of t minus e minus j omega t. Now, if we evaluate t from 0 to infinity, we know that this is bounded because by the Euler um by the Euler equation, we know that this is just this, the combination of a cosine and complex sine term. So it's bounded. So we only have to worry about this. More specifically, this term to see if it cascades to infinity or it does not. So we can amend this more. Be a little more specific with that, where our answer, even though what we wrote was right. This is the term that matters, the sigma term. 
according to the way that we defined our, our uh, Laplace transform. And so when you look at the plots, it's going to talk about the real and imaginary components. This is talking about the real and imaginary components within the exponent. So the sigma and the j omega. And a is not defined at a or to any part to the left of a. This is the region of convergence shown here. And as we see at sigma equal to zero, it is not defined. It does not converge. And this is where the Fourier transform is located. And so that's how we can graphically imagine where, um, where the Laplace transform is defined for what values of sigma it's defined and for look at our first Laplace transform. So we have cosine of t times a shifted step function. So since these aren't at the same, don't have the exact same shift, um, there isn't exactly a term in the Laplace tables that uh, corresponds to this. Th this doesn't look familiar, but we can uh, finagle it into a signal that's more um, that we can better characterize in, when doing the Laplace transform. So uh, one trick is to use our trigonometric identities. So if we add and subtract two, we can denote this as A and this is B. And recall in trigonometry, I think this is the sum identity, I believe, where if you have two angles within the cosine, you can express that as cosine A times cosine B minus sine A sine B. And since B is going to lead uh, to cosine T and sine T, which are constants, then we can, oh, the B is constant then we can evaluate it readily. So we get cosine of 2 times cosine t minus 2 times step function minus sine of 2 times sine of t minus 2 step function. So we know for the unilateral Laplace transform of cosine and sine, we derive that in class by um, by re-expressing it in exponential form. And since we can take the Laplace transform of the exponent, we can readily take the cosine and sine Laplace transform. And since we know that the, the Laplace transform of cosine and sine is derived in class, we get cosine of 2 times um, e minus 2s. This is the shift factor, so quite similar to the Fourier transform, uh, how the Fourier transform gets changed when we have a time shift, and it can be shown in a similar way as well through the Laplace transform formulation times s squared divided oh sorry times s divided by one plus s squared and then uh, we have minus sine of two minus e two s divided by one plus one plus s squared. And that's our final equation. But of course, it isn't defined everywhere. So as was mentioned in class, if you look at the Laplace table, it's only defined for real values of s that are greater than 0. And if we wanted to further prove it for ourselves, 
we could write it in this form. S divided by 1 plus S squared minus sine of 2 divided by 1 plus S squared. Again, when we're defining the region of convergence, which is very important, um, we want to look at the at the poles or the values in which the denominator is equal to zero, the values of s, which the denominator is equal to zero. So um, we can expand this as j plus s, j minus s. So the poles will be, if we look at the plot, this is, S oh sigma j omega if we're gonna draw our poles which we can denote as an s that's only equal to at s at sigma equal to zero and j omega equal to plus minus one and we can just write that as real values of s greater than zero. So that's how we can think of it if we're analyzing the Laplace transform directly. Now, if this isn't uh, intuitive, how we derive the ROC, it might be useful uh, on your own to go through the exact Laplace transform form and uh, when you derive it with the integral and see for what values of t um, the Laplace transform converges and, it, and for which values it doesn't converge. Um, something that's very important to note is notice how we had a time shift, yet this didn't shift the region of convergence. And that's because this value, the way it manifests in the Laplace transform, we get the e to the negative 2 of s, and there's no um, t term. And since that's the e to the negative 2 s, t is the thing that affects what values um, t converges to, a time shift does not shift the region of convergence in this case. So for the second signal, we have an integral of this more complicated looking term. So first we can write this as 0 minus t minus 1 e minus a of x times cosine omega naught x. dx minus. So as always, um, our strategy is to, is to rewrite the signal into, um, into a mixture of signals that we're more familiar with. And already we know this signal, and this one we might not have covered, but you can readily find it in Laplace tables. But we can uh, derive it here in discussion. So it's g1 of x. dx minus the integral 0 minus t minus 1 g of 2 of x dx. So what's the Laplace transform of g1 of x? Well, if you don't want to consult the Laplace table, we can find it directly, similar to how we find the Laplace transform or regular cosine omega not x, and that's to change it up into e minus ax Recall this is e j omega naught plus e negative j omega naught divided by two. 
So we can write this as e to the minus a minus j omega naught x divided by 2. Actually, let's just put the 1 half. Oh! Let's put the 1 half in front here. And it should be a bit more apparent now how we can apply evaluate the Laplace transform now. And so that's going to be equal to, let's actually just partition this signal to just this part, and then we get one half. Um, if we look at the tables, it's going to, if we look at the previously derived exponential uh, Laplace transform, we get one divided by s plus a minus j omega naught minus 1 divided by s minus plus a plus j omega naught. And so that's equal to 1 divided by 2 s plus a divided by s plus a squared plus omega naught squared. And so that is our Laplace transform. Of course, when we do the integral, the integral of uh, 0 minus t minus 1 of the Laplace of g of 2 of x dx is going to be equal to 1 divided by s, the Laplace of g2. I guess I can change that to t. So, combining this all together, we get 1 divided by s, of, uh, let's see, let's keep it in view, s plus a divided by s plus a squared plus omega naught squared. For the second part, uh, it's just the Laplace transform of the exponent. So we get 1 divided by s plus a. And when we combine this, we can see that multiply s plus a, let's see. Hmm, this is interesting. So I think it was easier to express it. Hmm. Okay, let's just tackle it. C plus A times C plus A squared plus omega naught squared. We get C plus A squared minus, um, oh, okay, actually it was much easier than I thought. So those parts cancel out, and that's our final expression. Oh, interesting. So this would be the answer if we evaluated uh, f of t, if actually, if the integral was from 0 to t. Hmm. 
So we're go we're shifting it one. So we're going from zero minus to t minus one. So that's equal to Laplace of g of t, where g of t is equal to zero minus t minus one. Oh. The integral from zero to t of e to the negative a of x times cosine omega naught of x minus one dx. Now we have f of t, which is equal to gt minus 1. So there's one last little trick here, the t minus 1, that I, that I didn't see. And of course, again, with the shift, we have g of s is going to be, uh, we can express the shift as multiplying by the exponent of negative s in Laplace, Laplacian space. So we get negative e to negative s omega naught squared divided by s times s plus a times s plus a squared plus omega naught squared. And do I have another? Yes. And that is our final expression. So the region of convergence of this part will be Let's see, so the integral of x, so if we look at the poles for this part, we know for uh, cosine omega naught x times the exponent negative e to the ax, that the convergence is for the real values of s that are greater than negative a. Convergence for this portion, now that we have the integral, is for the real values of s greater than zero. So for the total ROC, we need the union of the two convergences. So ROC is going to be uh, real values of S greater than negative A if A is greater than 0. Otherwise, it will be real values of S that are less than 0 if A is less than or equal to zero. And so that is our ROC that corresponds to our Laplacian transform. The triangle function that's shifted, how do we find the Laplace transform for this? So in this case, it's easier to decompose it into or I guess express the signal a little bit differently. So since the triangle function is a little bit more heuristic, um, a signal that's a little, more, a little bit more manageable would be the ramp function. So we can say that this is equal to r of t minus 2, r of t minus 1, 
and then we have one final gram function at t minus 2 to make sure that there's no zero values past t equal to 2. So what is the Laplace transform of the ramp function? Well, we know that d of d, recall, is uh, equal to unity u of t transforms to 1 divided by s, and t times u of t, which is coincidentally equal to the ramp function, transforms to 1 divided by s squared. So with that, it's just a matter of applying Laplacian of uh, ramp function and taking into account any uh, shifts, which we can express as minus s and plus to the minus 2s. And so that is our final expression. So what will be the region of convergence? So if you look at this quickly, you might think that it might be zero. Well, um, since we have a finite signal, so it only takes on values at a limited t, it, um, the f of t doesn't take on values at at t greater than a certain value. So this makes the function a little bit more unique. So we'll have to evaluate um, the Laplacian directly. Look at the Laplacian form directly to get a little bit more sense of this function. So recall our uh, form for the Laplacian. And so we get the integral from 0 to 2 f of t, e minus s of t, dt. And so when we take the exponent, we're just going to have the ramp function. We see since t isn't going to infinity, there's no blowing up that's happening. So it will converge for any value of s. The main problem is if um, as t goes to infinity, th that's where the blowing up happens. So what about at 0? Um, well, we can evaluate that directly as well. And so we have the integral c of f of t of e to the 0 dt. And so this will be 1. And since f of and since we're just summing the area of f of t, we also get that it's a value. So poles are uh, useful to look at, but um, if they're centered at zero, you might have to evaluate the Laplacian form directly. And actually, um, this might not necessarily mislead you as well because we can um, we only know that it's um, undefined. Oh, sorry. At s equals to as s goes to zero. So while it seems to indicate that it will be infinity and undefined, as a last resort, we can always use L'Hopital's rule. to uh, evaluate the limit.
And so, again, we take L'Hopital's rule by taking the derivative of the top and bottom portion. Infinity is going to be equal to C2 to the E minus S uh, and minus 2 E minus 2S divided by 2S. And we can do this again. And we get minus 2E negative S uh, plus 4E negative 2S divided by 2, which will give us a finite value, which will be equal to 1. So even though poles might be indicative of uh, discontinuity of a uh, region where um, voloplastion doesn't exist, uh, we need to be careful. And we can double check by using Laplacian, but by using L'Hopital's rule or looking at the Laplacian form. But if you see in the table, uh, that there's a ROC value, there's a ROC region that's not across all S, then, then it's safe to assume that there's poles or something that prevent it from taking on all values of S. Values of S. Next, we're gonna move on to the inverse Laplace transform. And uh, for this, you remember that the inverse Laplace transform had this uh, uh, more uh, less straightforward integral to evaluate. So uh, for a lot of these problems, we're just going to be applying the, um, looking at the Laplace transform table and uh, doing partial fraction decomposition to work the signal into something that uh, looks more familiar. So in the first case we have f of s and let's um, rewrite this as s plus 2 times g of s where g of s is equal to 1 divided by s plus 1 squared divided by s plus 2 and we need to find a b and c such that we can decompose the fraction so that we can take the inverse Laplace transform. And so uh, the quickest way to do this, you can solve this by, uh, of course, solving a linear system of equations. But in this case, the easiest way to do this is through the cover up method. So. Um, in the cover-up method, we could analyze A and C, and it's a bit more intuitive if you, uh, let's say, for uh, if we want to find C, we multiply both sides by S plus 2, and then we find that um, for evaluating C, the quickest way to do this is uh, we cover up A we cover up A and B, and uh, the S plus 2 term, which is now just, just multiplying by S plus 2, so that we get 1 divided by S plus 1 squared is equal to S plus 2 times A plus S plus 1 squared plus S plus 2 times S plus 1 times B plus C. So if we evaluate... at s equal to 2, we get that this goes to 0 and this goes to 0. So c is equal to 1 divided by 3 squared, so that's equal to 
one ninth. Oh wait, and yep. Yeah. Actually, uh, we evaluate at negative 2, since we're looking at s plus 2. Sorry, evaluate at negative 2, so the other terms go to 0, and then we get negative 1. So it's equal to 1. So, c is equal to 1. And we can also do this with a, of course. So a is going to be equal to 1 divided by s plus 2, evaluated at s equal to negative 1. So that's also going to be equal to 1. Let's cover up method. And then for b, we can't use the cover-up method, but we already know a and c, so we can just solve it directly. And the easiest case here would be to just set, um, we can set s equal to anything. So we can uh, just set s equal to 0. which I think is the easiest way. So uh, if s is equal to 0, then we get that um, g of 0 is equal to 1 divided by 1 plus 2. No, oh, 1 times 2. So 1 half is equal to 1 divided by 1 plus uh, b plus uh, 1 half. So uh, b is equal to negative 1. So with that, we have a, b, and c. And so uh, continuing on, we know g of s is going to be equal to 1 divided by s plus 1 squared minus 1 divided by s plus 1 plus 1 divided by s plus 2. And we can uh, readily do the inverse Laplacian of that, which will give us t to the e negative t of u of t minus e negative t u of t plus e negative 2 of t u, u of t. So uh, remember, we also have uh, this term in front of g of s, and that's going to be equal to e negative squared, which is a constant, we know how to deal with that very easily, times e negative s, which is equivalent to a time shift. So um, we get that f of t is equal to e negative squared, Let's see, e negative squared uh, g t minus 1. So that's going to be equal to, let me write this in green, and the final answer is going to be e negative squared times t minus 1 times e minus t minus 1 times u t minus 1 minus e minus t minus 1, u t minus 1, plus e of minus 2, t minus 1, u of t minus 1. And we could also drag out the u t minus 1 term, since that's common to all of the factors. And uh, let's see, we could also combine these terms. So let's just write that more concisely. That's equal to e minus 2 of u t minus 1 times uh, t minus 2 e minus t minus 1 plus e minus 2 t minus 1. 
And so that is our final answer. So in the second problem, we see we have a little bit more of a complicated expression in the numerator. And this doesn't affect our strategy at all. We can still do the cover-up method. So let's evaluate f of s at s equal to negative 1 is going to be equal to 1 minus 1 plus 1. So those cancel out. Divided by 1 times 2. So it's going to be 1 half f of s evaluated at s equal to negative 2 is going to be, and that's equal to a. If we have a is equal to s plus 1 plus b divided by s plus 2 divided plus c divided by s plus 3. So next, when we evaluate it at negative 2, we're going to get 4 minus 2 plus 1 divided by minus 1 plus plus 1. And we multiply these. So we get negative 3 is equal to b. And then we evaluate f of s at s is equal to negative 3 which will be 9 minus 3 plus 1 divided by uh, minus 2 times minus 1. So we have two negative values here. So we get uh, 7 divided by 2. So 7 halves. And with that, uh, we can plug in our newly found values. So we have one half s plus one minus three divided by s plus two uh, plus seven halves divided by s plus three and that's going to be that means that f of t if we take the inverse laplace is going to be one half e negative t minus three e negative two t plus seven halves e negative 3t, uh, and then u of t. And so that is our final expression, so just applying the cover-up method directly. Okay, so for part c, we have a bit of a trickier problem, and the problem is with the numerator. Uh, so since we have s plus 2 squared in the bottom, it would involve uh, taking two derivatives of the expression. So uh, we can take a little bit of a clever shortcut here. So um, so we know what s plus 2 is, uh, squared is uh, composed of. So if we want to complete the perfect square, we can, let's see, We can, uh, in order to make the perfect square, we can add 4s um, plus 4 and subtract 4s and 4 and divide by s plus 2 squared. And so this will be, this part will be equal to s plus 2 squared, and then we don't have... Uh, squared term in the numerator, which simplifies our our calculations quite a bit. So, okay, that'll be equal to s plus 2 squared minus 4s minus 4 divided by s plus 2 squared, which is going to be equal to 1 minus 4s minus 4s four, uh, divided by s plus 2 squared minus 4 divided by s plus 2 squared. And so we still have to take a derivative, but it's uh, a little bit easier. And we have to take the derivative, of course, because we're multiplying by s. So recall that we know what um, 1 divided by s plus 2 squared 
we know uh, what the inverse Laplacian of that is, which is, of course, uh, T. Let me... Uh, Let me write this more clearly. So taking the inverse Laplacian of 1 divided by s plus 2 squared is going to be equal to t minus e2 of t u of t, which I believe we derived earlier. Otherwise, you can find that in the Laplace table. So, yes. So, uh, and then, of course, if we add... Uh, S term to our uh, function, then the inverse Laplacian and the time domain will be d dt of t minus e t, 2 of t u of t. And we can uh, readily find this derivative by uh, applying the product rule. So it's also kind of easy to see how if we took two derivatives, the computation might get a little bit messy. Actually, so um, let's see, the d, t, d, t, and also we have to add, evaluate it. We have to add um, t times e minus 2 t u of t. Evaluate t of 0 for, for completion, which uh, is going to be 0. So, so th this is just for the sake of completion if we're dealing with derivatives in the Laplacian space. All right, so when we take the derivative, we can apply the product rule. So split the derivative into two parts. So first take the derivative of t e minus 2 of t while keeping the step function intact. And then we leave the t e minus 2 of t and take the derivative of the step function, which is not 0 everywhere. All right, and then um, we can also apply the product rule to the t times the exponent to get e minus 2 of t plus the derivative of e minus 2 of t. So the derivative of this portion, e minus 2 of t, is going to be minus 2. So instead we will get a negative sign. We'll get minus 2 of t, e minus 2 of t, times the step function. And the derivative of our step function right here is going to be the direct delta. So plus t, e minus 2 of t times the direct delta. And that is our entire expression for, for the, just that component, actually. So um, just for this part. And also the direct delta. So, um, OK, so we know uh, if we. Uh, the, um, this component will only take on so the value so uh, this entire function um, the direct delta is being multiplied by this function and uh, since this function only takes will only take on any values at t is equal to zero and it will be equal to zero at t is equal to zero it will be zero elsewhere by the sifting property so this is just evaluated at zero everywhere. So we can just retain this part. So let me uh, 
draw the line here. And then uh, th this uh, function, we can readily find the inverse Laplace transform. And our final result will be f of t is equal to the Laplacian of 1, which is going to be the Dirac delta, uh, minus 4 times the expression that we just found. So let me zoom out. So it's going to be 4 times e minus 2 of t minus 2 of t e minus 2 of t u of t and then minus uh, 4 t e minus 2 of t times the step function And we have some terms that we can cancel out here and here. So this ends up being, uh, actually ends up being just, uh, I'm gonna write this in green, the delta function minus four times e minus two of t minus t e two of t times the step function. And so that is our signal in uh, t the time domain. Okay, so for the next part, we're going to go over some, uh, apply some properties of the Laplace and see um, um, if these statements hold true. So for the first part, we're going to see uh, if h of t is the impulse response of a stable and causal system, taking the derivative of the impulse response is also stable. So... Um, Again, this is something that uh, the taking the Laplacian is very one of the main functions of taking the Laplacian is uh, is uh, evaluating the stability of a system. So we know h of s is stable. D divided by d. If we take the derivative of the impulse response, we know the Laplacian will be s times h of s. Since we're just adding a zero as opposed to a pole, that doesn't uh, affect the ROC at all. If we do the plot, then this can be seen as just adding uh, zeros are seen as adding circles. The poles are seen as adding the x's. Zeros we don't have to worry about because the Laplacian will be finite and therefore stable. So, um, yes, if h of t is stable, then taking the derivative of h of t is also going to be stable. Next, uh, let h of t be the impulse response of a stable and causal system, then h of t must be unstable if we take the derivative. Uh, all right, so h of t is going to be h of s. Then um, we know if we take the derivative integral, sorry, of h of t, that's going to be equal to 1 divided by s, h of s. So now we have a new, we have a new, um, we have a new pole, which can add a discontinuity in cause the system to be unstable, but not necessarily. For example, we could have uh, an s in the numerator, and then it would just be equal to a 1, and it, and, and it would be stable. So in the example that we analyzed before, when we're taking the Laplacian transforms, um, remember uh, we took the limit, we evaluate the limit. So even though the denominator goes to zero. If the numerator also goes to zero, then it's perfectly possible by L'Hopital's rule that it can be finite. Finite by... So we have to evaluate this on a case-by-case -case scenario. So even though the presence of a pole strongly suggests that 
our signal is not going to be stable if we evaluate it uh, at s equal to zero um, So if it's not going to be stable at certain values of s, and since we're taking the integral from negative infinity to t, then be unstable. Um, it, it's very possible that it could be stable for all values of s, depending on our h of t, or an, and by extent h of s. So um, I would refer back to uh, one c of the discussion for an example where. Uh, the we take the limit of f of s, and even though the denominator goes to zero, it evaluates at a finite value. For problem four, we are given a causal LTI system, and we have some limited knowledge of the input, and we know that the output will be of this form. So we need to find a constant A that satisfies the input-output mapping. So recall, and uh, this was shown in uh, lecture 14 and uh, in the previous discussion as well, uh, the eigenfunction. Property of... Uh, the Fourier transform, where uh, if we have an input ej omega, ej omega naught of t, nope, okay, then the Fourier, then, um, and if we have a, let me draw this, and if we have a um, LTI system, we know the output will be an eigenfunction of the input. It will have a scalar hj omega naught times ej omega naught t. So it will be the input scaled by actually the Fourier transform function. And this was shown in lecture by uh, applying the Fourier transform properties. So now, this is a little bit less straightforward to show with the Laplacian, but in this case, we see in the output, these two terms are relatively easy to take the Laplacian transform of, but we haven't really dealt too much with the bilateral transform, and it's much, much more difficult to show. So um, we don't need to actually calculate the Laplacian transform for this entire function, for e, e at for e4 of t. We, we don't need to find it for every point s. Um, and we can show uh, the eigenfunction property for uh, the Laplacian transform. And we do this by the LTI system definition. So we do have some idea of the input-output mapping. So I will show that the E, this, this portion will correspond to this portion. So let's say that we have some input E S naught of T. We know that the input takes this form. And since it's h of t is LTI, we know that y of t is going to be the, the convolution of h of t times x of t. And so that will give us this. More precisely, uh, it will be, let me see, h of tau times s, and then we have t minus tau, directly applying the definition of convolution. And so we have, we can take out the e s naught term, which is going to be x of t, outside of the integral. And then we get the integral h tau 
e to the s negative s not tau d tau and this should also look familiar so we can write this as h of s evaluated at s equal to s naught and we have of course the input es naught of t and so that is our uh, eigenfunction property for the Laplacian transform where we have a constant times the input b equal to y of t so uh, to write that out again, e of s naught of t through an LTI system is going to be equal to h of the Laplacian transform of the transfer function evaluated at s equal to s naught, so at only one point of s times the input. And this is something that needs to be used in the homework as well. So since we know that this part, so we know s naught of t corresponds to the exponent 4 of t. So the delta function must correspond to these two other terms. So if we just focus on these components, let's, we know that h of t is equal to negative delta t plus u of t. So we know that the impulse we can write it as this portion since we know that the mm -hmm. x function includes the impulse function so the impulse response will just be this portion since we attributed which signal in the input corresponds to which part of the signal in the output and so uh, that again we know the that the Fourier transform of that it's going to be negative one plus a times s plus 2. And since we don't know a just from this expression directly, we can further uh, detail out the transfer function by um, solving the second equation that we found, where uh, we evaluate the transfer function at s equal to 4 and uh, let's see if we plug that we know that's equal to 1 since we have 1 times e to the negative 4 of t so that means that uh, that 1 is going to be equal if, if we plug that into the, this equation that's going to be equal to negative 1 plus a divided by 4 plus 2. So that's going to be 6. So 6 is equal to minus 6 plus a. a is equal to 12. And therefore we have h of s is equal to negative 1 plus 12 divided by s plus 2. So we found our transfer function and I think this uh, this particular problem is worth looking at in detail since there were a few leaps of faith that we had to take since we know that x the input is composed of a delta function and a exponent that takes on values at t less than zero so we had a partition out the output to see which parts of the output are going to correspond to the impulse function which can readily give us the transfer function since we can by the property of linearity we can look at uh, the delta function separately convolved uh, put through the system since it's an LTI system and we can look at the input of the 
exponent put through the system separately. And by the eigenfunction property of the, of the Laplacian, which I just showed, uh, we know that this part of this component of the input is going to correspond to this. So the S naught will be equal to four. And we can evaluate the transfer function at a specific par part, which is S naught. And um, using both pieces, we can get the complete transfer. Finally, I'd like to take a little bit of a step back and review phasers, especially as how they relate to homework five based off uh, input I have gotten from other students. So going back all the way to lecture one, so I know we just now we were covering Laplacian and we're looking at the imaginary and real parts in the exponent term, um, when we're applying the Euler equation, we're uh, um, decomposing the base, so the entire signal, not just the exponent, into real and imaginary for the Fourier transform. So be sure to keep those concepts uh, partitioned. So Euler equation says that we can represent e j theta is cosine theta plus j sine theta, where this would be the real component of the signal, this would be the imaginary component, this would be the phasor form. Um, and the two, we can switch them, we can go from the two quite quickly and um, The equations you might have noticed are quite uh, similar to the going from Cartesian coordinates to phasor coordinates, where the Cartesian coordinates would be the real and imaginary uh, breakdown of the signal, and the phasor form would be, I forgot the A, would be uh, the, the polar coordinates. So we can also imagine the signal as a vector where the axes are the real and imaginary coordinates and the the second interpretation the right side of the equation would be uh, visualizing the vector in terms of cartesian coordinates left side would be uh, imagining the vector in terms of polar coordinates where we have the amplitude a and we have the phase b the angle theta so we can get a We can get the entire magnitude of A by um, So let's say the signal is f of t. So we can get the a magnitude of a by um, getting the real component of f of t, squaring it, and the imaginary component of f of t and squaring it. And the angle theta is going to be the a tan 2 function of the imaginary component the f of t divided by the real component so um, with that let's go back to some problems in homework 5 that deal with phasers so again phasers uh, when we think about that, that's also, there's an intuition behind it. So whereas the amplitude is just the entire magnitude of both the complex and the, uh, of the real and imaginary, it, it's the magnitude of the, com of the complex component. 
um, the, the phase would be the more of a ratio. So we see how much we have of the real component compared to the imaginary component. So if the signal is entirely real, we know that the phase is going to be constant, zero or pi, in order to take out the imaginary component. And if it's entirely imaginary, uh, the phase will be constant as well. So with that, let's go to homework five. Let's review problem 1a. So uh, here we're analyzing the Fourier series for a signal f of t for a purely imaginary signal, which we can represent by uh, a purely real signal multiplied by j. So if we work through the problem, recall that we found that the in the solution, as is worked out, you can refer to on CCLE, we know that the real component of the Fourier series coefficients is going to be t of 0, t of 0 plus t of z not capital T naught, g of t sine 2 pi of k divided by t naught t dt, and the imaginary component of c of k is going to be 1 divided by t naught, to go t naught, t naught plus capital T naught, g of t, cosine uh, 2 pi k divided by t naught t dt. Uh, and in the lecture, we know that uh, when we're looking at the phase, we can relate it to the co complex conjugate and the Fourier series of the complex conjugate, which we find with the following formula. We know that the CK star is going to be 1 divided by capital T naught times uh, J, G of T. times cosine 2 pi of k divided by t naught t. Uh, All right, and um, plus j sine of uh, 2 pi of k divided by t naught t dt. So we just flip the sign compared to how we do it in the solution. All right, and uh, once we work through that, we find out that the real part of uh, the conjugate uh, for a series coefficients is going to be equal to the negative, to the minus 1 times the for a series coefficients. And the imaginary part is going to be the same. Okay. So, how do we relate the phase of CK to of the conjugate Fourier series coefficients to the regular Fourier series coefficients? Well, we know that the phase of CK is going to be the arctan two of um, let's see the real part. <coughs> 
CK. Uh, never mind the asterisk. Divide by the imaginary part of C of K. And we know the phase. And we know that the phase of uh, the conjugate Fourier series coefficients is going to be arctan 2 of, uh, oh, I flipped around. So did I write that? Okay. It's going to be the imaginary on top, of course. Divide by the real for real part of the Fourier series. Coefficients. And I can just instantaneously substitute Fourier series coefficients divided by minus the real part of the complex Fourier series coefficients. And with the arctan2 function, we know that's going to be equal to... Um, Let's see, that's going to be arctan minus real ck. And we, we can take out the asterisk. Divide by the imaginary part of c of k. Plus minus pi. And... Uh, the plus or minus depends on the, si uh, the sign of the imaginary part. So if the imaginary part um, if imaginary part of C of K is greater than zero, then um, greater or equal to zero, we get plus pi. If the imaginary part of C of K is less than zero, we get minus pi. And of course we can drag out the minus sign and we get that, um, oh, I should have for ck. Well, we can show the same thing the other way around, but we get c of k, it's equal to minus uh, ck plus minus pi. Or uh, conversely, we can flip these around showing the same same argument. So I would review the arctan2, the atan2 function on uh, Wikipedia if you want. Or otherwise, there's a second way that we can show this, that we need that this shift of pi or minus pi compared to the classroom example. So an alternative way to do this is to again draw from this relation that we've just derived. So uh, when you do the arctan2 function, it's more of a function. So instead of dividing it, I, I suppose it's better to um, I suppose it's better to write it in this way. So it's a function because we only care about the sign of the denominator. That's the only thing that affects whether we need the shift of pi to be plus or minus pi. And uh, if it doesn't seem intuitive, uh, you can go directly from this uh, definition that I just squared. And perhaps this is an easier way. We can write the real part of CK as cosine 
let's see. It's going to be the magnitude of CK star times cosine um, angle of CK star. And we need that equal to the negative part of C of K times cosine angle CK. We can rewrite the imaginary component as the magnitude of C of K times cosine, oh, times sine angle CK. And we need that equal to the magnitude CK times um, sine of C of K. All right, um, since we have this relation, we also know by the magnitude equation that C of K is going to be equal to the magnitude of the of the conjugate is of course equal to the magnitude of C of K by the definition of the magnitude. Since we're taking the square root of the real imaginary parts, the sign of the imaginary part component doesn't matter the magnitudes are the same so here we are end up just uh, trying to m match the angle c of k to express the angle of c of k in terms of the conjugate phase c of k uh, we notice that we have the negative sign here and since cosine is an even function the only way we can match it to uh, the other cosine function is by having c of k equal to uh, pi minus ck star and that's if ck is positive so we need to have a plus minus to account for both cases and so that's how we get the, the second way that we can get the phase relation between uh, the Fourier series coefficients the phase of the Fourier series coefficients of the conjugate. All right, next I'm gonna go over problem 2C, showing that plot 2C is even in time domain xt. So um, in the answer key, it says that the signal is uh, even in the time domain because the in frequency space the signal is Hermitian. So what does this mean and how can we see it by just looking at it? So recall for Hermitian signal we have this when we have the conjugate of x j omega which means the complex term flip signs is equal to x negative j omega. And this, if we have this property in Fourier signal, this supposedly gives us a real signal. Um, and I think this is useful to verify. So, I'm just gonna quickly plot 2c just to remind people who don't have the homework problem in front of them. So if we just see the phase and the amplitude plots. And um, we know that the amplitude is real and even and the phase is odd. Sorry, uh, I, we, I mean, the amplitude's always real. So we know the amplitude's even, though, and the signal of the phase across omega is, is odd. So let's expand this term and see if uh, that helps give us better intuition. So we know that, um, let's see, 
we know that x negative j omega, we can express that as the real part of x negative j omega uh, plus j times the amplitude of negative x j omega times the sine of the phase of x negative j omega. And the Hermitian will be equal to the real part of x j omega plus, not plus, minus, because it's a Hermitian, minus j phase x j omega times the sine phase x j omega. So, looking through the plot, we see that since the amplitude of x j omega is even, these two will be equal to each other. And since cosine is an even function, we know the real components will be necessarily equal to each other. Um, because when we look at the phase, we know the phase is odd, so x j omega of next negative x j omega is equal to negative phase x j omega. And then since phase is, is, um, is odd, x negative j omega, we can drag that out. We can replace that with this x negative x j omega. And since sine is odd, we can further uh, replace that. And by, by moving the sine all the way outside. So um, for a Hermitian signal, we can expect the amplitude to be even and the phase to be odd. All right, and um, x j omega is even, phase is odd. And if you look again at the inverse Fourier transform, let me make it clear that's capital xj omega times ej omega t d omega. You'll notice that the symmetry, if we break break it down the phasor form again using the Euler equation. This sort of symmetry will cause the complex components to cancel out when we're computing the signal in the time domain. So we will 